go. So I would like to welcome you to the healthcare informatics information session. Um, let's see if I can get this out of your way. I'm Dr. Sharon Jerizza Wilson. I'm also the uh, director of the healthcare informatics program. And I will provide an overview of the um, program as it is today. We're looking at making some changes and we can talk about that too. And then I'm gonna be followed by um, China Hutchins who is our graduate program advisor and she'll give you some information on admissions. So a little bit about the college here. Um, the University of Colorado Institute's Medical Campus is um, globally recognized as a health center at the um, forefront of transformational um, education in science, medicine, and healthcare, uh, which is pretty exciting. Um, that means that we're up to um, date and current and also pushing the envelope on um, new techniques and um, innovation uh, for not only our students, but also for the populations that we work with. So earning an online degree at the university gives you an opportunity to collaborate with a multitude of professors, practicing clinicians and researchers to really give you a meaningful hands-on learning environment. Uh, we were, uh, rated one of the best online programs by U.S. News and World Report for 2021. So that's pretty exciting. And we have been in the past also. The informatics label um, that you currently hear across the board refers to um, many educational programs that include medicine, coders, biomedical informatics researchers, um, but there's a couple definitions to give it a little bit more focus. So the American Medical Informatics Association, which is the um, association for the science and academic arm of uh, healthcare informatics, they state that informatics is a specialty that transforms uh, needed information and leverages technology to improve health and healthcare equity, safety, quality, and outcomes. And the American Nurses Association has just updated their scope and standards and it, the uh, newest edition should be out either, I'm thinking it's going to be probably December, maybe January. Um, we have a new definition that states, um, nursing informatics is a specialty that transforms data into needed information. Um, and we look at ways to use knowledge to improve healthcare and the delivery of healthcare services. So informatics is really, really important um, in our healthcare field because we're becoming more digitized. And as we become more digitized, healthcare will transform and become dependent on different technologies and not just the healthcare facilities and the providers, but our consumers of healthcare, they are using more and more digital technologies to become informed and to, gain, and to engage in their care. So um, providing an education in this field, excuse me, is very, very competitive and has grown rapidly because of this exponential growth in the digitization of the information. Um, so informatics specialists are required. Um, the College of Nursing intentionally created a healthcare informatics program versus a strictly nursing informatics program for a couple of different reasons. Uh, one specifically is that we have um, multiple disciplines that we work with in informatics and the informatics specialist needs to be able to translate that clinical information to the other disciplines or meaning like your uh, computer science people or your uh, data engineers or data scientists. Um, we also encourage all of the um, clinicians that work in other health disciplines such as public health and or um, allied health to consider taking some of these courses because collectively as a um, 
healthcare community, we need to have the skill set needed to move healthcare forward for the um, improving the quality and the uh, consistency of healthcare delivery. So this is a quote from one of our students that recently graduated. And uh, Danielle said before the program, she really had a limited amount of information um, about healthcare informatics, but she was really interested in it. And now that she is working in her career field, she finds that she can um, review the projects and requirements and uh, incorporate evidence-based theories and standards into whether she's doing a build of technology or training that she's doing with um, her colleagues and that she really didn't uh, realize how much she didn't know that this degree would help her in her current job. So she applies the concepts every day, which really speaks um, boldly to um, what the program does provide. It provides you with the ability to have a hands-on understanding of actual skills and knowledge that you'll need in the career environment. And you can read more about Dan Danielle on um, our webpage, on the landing page for the Healthcare Informatics program. So a little bit about the design features. Importantly, and I think this is one of the best parts, is the program itself is extremely flexible. Um, the healthcare informatics program is built to be fully remote so and asynchronous, meaning that you can have learning regardless of where you are in the world, literally. And we do have some uh, students who are international. Uh, even though the time zones can be challenging, the program still fits their lifestyle. Um, the students come from many diverse backgrounds, but we all have a, a common goal for the students, and that's earning a really high quality degree that, as I've mentioned, that you can take forward into your career path. You also get uh, personalized support uh, from the beginning of enrollment all the way through the program, because um, in order to succeed, I feel, especially with a graduate program, you need to make those um, connections in that network because learning is deeper and richer when you're in a graduate program. So innovation. Um, I've already mentioned that we have flexibility in the program and courses, but I also wanted to mention that the course, courses themselves are thoughtfully designed to make your online learning very interesting. Um, it's very collaborative and it's available. Like I said, you can take it anytime um, and anywhere in the world. You will um, engage with the use of innovative technologies and also hand uh, hands-on projects uh, so that you can discuss um, and develop career-focused um, experiences through the coursework. One of the benefits of this program is that we have a student membership that's available to all students in the informatics program. And that is uh, with uh, HIMSS, which is the Healthcare Information Management System Society. This is an international association and they have multiple disciplines that our members, so everyone from a vendor community all the way through to clinicians. Um, and it provides you with the ability to create these very, very rich networks. So you can actually connect with people who are leaders and movers and shakers um, on a national scale or international scale um, through the, the um, association of hymns, but also it helps you develop your network, your immediate network. Um, I was at a, a recent meeting, informatics meeting, um, that was associated with hymns, and I ran across a student who had graduated from CU. He wasn't a student anymore. He was in, um, he was in the uh, vendor space, and he wanted to find out um, what CU was currently doing and how he might be able to partner with the university. So these networks help to um, bring more experiences to you as a student, but also can um, move your career path forward. 
So a couple of the exit options, uh, you can enroll in the program and graduate with a master's of science in healthcare informatics, or you could go into the PhD or DMP program. And there's a couple of different applications for that. Now I'll address this a little bit more, but um, I like to plant the seed for continuing education, especially at the DMP and PhD level, because it gives you another level of skill set and knowledge uh, that you can actually change the practice, not only in informatics, but in our delivery of healthcare in general. So some of the faculty, um, I've already mentioned that um, I'm Dr. Jerizzo Wilson, um, and I'm the program director. And then there is Dr. Edwan Bach. Uh, her focus is on communication to improve patient reported outcomes, and she does teach some of the classes. Dr. Nick Hardiker is international. He is in the UK, and he's um, well known for his semantic representation work on nursing practice and healthcare delivery. He does teach our semantic representation course, and he taps into experts um, in the field to provide some guest lectures. Dr. Ton Ang is um, a data scientist in the School of Medicine, and his research is in the privacy preserving record links and data quality and data harmonization uh, machine learning and natural language processing. He teaches our database management course, and I've been told by students that they really enjoy this one because it um, provides them with a lot of hands-on experience that they can readily use quickly in their new careers. Dr. Mustafa Askinet uh, teaches the decision support and database management course. And he has a research focus in machine learning and patient outcomes. And then um, Dr. Samantha Stonebreaker, she uh, works in the area of digital education apps and persons living with HIV. And she does this on an international level and um, has studied uh, individuals in the Dominican Republic. So as you can see, these are just some of the individuals that are teaching our courses and uh, you'll get a lot of experience working with them and some great insight. So the curriculum design itself is modulized, excuse me, mod modulized uh, so that you can get this very deep immersion in learning and versus learning a new concept every week. So the modules are between three and four weeks and uh, you typically have four modules during uh, a semester. The um, instruction is determined by your own background and experience. And I know that sounds kind of interesting, but what it does is that, um, the way the courses are set up, instead of teaching through video lectures and narrated presentations, uh, we provide a learning guide for you to take um, through the, the um, entire course and it helps you achieve the learning outcomes. And the learning guide is tailored um, to those who are not only new in the field, but are actually practicing in the field already. So that means that there's new information for those that already have been working and it's um, developed in a way and modeled in a way that individuals who are new to the field gain a solid understanding of the content. Along the way, you're going to be engaged in learning activities that scaffold your knowledge acquisition uh, so that you can accomplish objectives for each of the modules and all the learning activities um, and outcome assessments are built on real world experiences. So for example, when I teach our foundations course or some of the other courses, I ask the students to think about what they're currently doing in their practice and to identify a barrier or something that needs to be improved and take the assignment and apply it to that. So this becomes something that they can actually um, optimize in their current practice. So that's how these modules help to build on your existing information and knowledge. So this is an example of one of the program plans. 
and a little bit about the courses. Um, the foundations course is required for all master's students. It's an introductory course on healthcare informatics and includes um, in, um, an overview of the data information knowledge and wisdom continuum that is becoming very prominent in all um, nursing spectrums. It used to be focused just on informatics, but it speaks to nursing as a whole. Um, it also addresses the various health IT tools that are available. The next is semantic representation, which I mentioned a little bit about um, with Dr. Hardiker. And it introduces all the students to um, the world of formalizing nursing phenomena to foster uh, data management and retrieval. And you'll examine the codification and the classification systems terminologies and reference terminologies and ontologies and standards that are used um, in different types of technologies, especially within the electronic health records, which um, allow the transfer of data, patient data from one area to another and for reporting quality measures. The decision support and data management course um, provides uh, an ability for you to have a greater understanding of the decision sciences and data management that are required within um, the context specifically for the AAA. So improve the, the care, the quality, and the cost of healthcare. Um, it also will review some of the decision support tools such as data mining and point of care alerts and surveillance tools and benchmarking, which is very useful for all levels of practice. Um, and uh, the decision support tools are becoming um, almost ubiquitous within electronic health records. So it provides a good foundation for students for going forward. The human computer interaction design principles um, helps to teach students um, to look at the personal health record or an app and then take a specific patient population and um, develop this tool for the use, usability. And the learners look at the concepts and theories of the human computer interaction and the um, usability within practice. And database management digs deeper and it applies um, the concepts and principles of databases so that you actually are starting to look at um, designing a patient registry using SQL for queries and using an open source database. And then the digital tools for connected health um, brings the uh, real uh, applications and experiences with looking at the tools, how it affects patient engagement and data transfer for um, connecting patients to their healthcare and to the resources that they need on, on a legal, ethical, and social and policy level. Information life cycles provides an opportunity for the users um, or learners to, to function um, within a, a project team because we develop um, um, a, a life cycle for an EHR from planning analysis and uh, design specifications and uh, implementation so that the individual understands how the technology matures and when we need to update versus retiring that particular system. And then knowledge management um, is a solid course. It looks more at the data information and knowledge continuum and learners learn to translate that knowledge into practice um, by identifying a problem area and selecting a knowledge management solution um, and designing some functional specifications. So as with any master's program, we have a comprehensive exam and the comprehensive exam for the informatics program occurs during the final semester and it demonstrates um, the student's ability to integrate theory, practice, and research based on their, their practicum. And the practicum is approximately 270 hours. We do help students with placement on that. But for the comprehensive exam, they will take their practicum and they will provide the story of their experience and they have a discussion with the faculty panel. 
you can um, obtain some certification credentialing after you're done with your program. The first is the ANCC, so the American Nurses Credentialing Center. Um, they do provide an RN to BC credential, which is currently under revision. Um, they're considering um, identifying it different than an RNBC since there's so many specialties with a similar um, credential. The other through HIMSS, um, they offer two different levels. One is for early careerists and the other is for more experience. There are no requirements on when you can take these. So if you're really interested in obtaining um, a credential, I encourage uh, students to either look for the uh, RNBC or they may want a, um, a second credential as an early careerist through HIMSS. The last one is offered through ANIA, which is the American Medical Information Association. Um, they have a very rigid credentialing process. You need to have four to six years of experience, and you also need to have either a master's or a doctoral degree. Um, originally, it was only available to physicians, but I'm happy to say last year, they opened it up to all um, healthcare clinicians. So when you apply, and uh, China will talk a little bit more about this, you can apply through the nursingcast.org. Uh, you do need letters of recommendation, trans, official transcript, boy, excuse me, official transcripts, and a one-time application fee. Um, if you have questions, you can go to the nursing.ucdenver.edu informatics and uh, submit a question, uh, which will come to me. Um, or you can reach out directly to me or China and we'll be more than happy to make sure that you have your questions answered. So a little bit about the doctor of nursing practice versus the PhD, the difference between the two, the DMP is the terminal degree in nursing similar to the terminal degree in medicine, the MD. But uh, with the DMP, you're actually taking the evidence and applying it into the clinical environment. Uh, within informatics, um, we do not have a specific DMP or PhD program, but you can model your focus for either of the two degrees specifically to informatics. So if it's a PhD, which is more research-based, you would be looking at a research um, dissertation that's focused on possibly um, how a particular uh, type of um, question related to a patient population is found within a big database versus a DMP, which might be the manipulation of the data within a clinical environment to improve the outcomes of the patient care delivery. And Dr. Peggy Jenkins is your contact uh, for questions about either of these degrees. And um, just so that you have a little better understanding, here's an example of the DMP Health Systems Leadership um, Curriculum a Program Plan. And as you can see, when you look towards the bottom, there's seminars and a project. This is the area where you would start to focus in after you've completed the requirements for the DMP. Um, you would focus in on the informatics components. So you have plenty of time and hours that are attributed to your specialty in informatics. Um, so if you do have questions, please reach out to uh, Dr. Jenkins on that, or you can reach out to me and I can give you a little bit more information. And with that, I'd like to know if you have any questions. Okay, hearing none, I'm going to switch over to China and let her uh, give you her um, information related to uh, getting started. Okay, so again, I appreciate um, you joining us today, Leanne. And again, my portion is, is uh, was mentioned, we'll talk specifically about admissions. So how to get started, whether you're eligible, um, you know, and, and some of those next steps. The cycle is currently open and has been um, since September 1st, and it will close December 15th. So you'll, you'll hear that kind of echoed, and it is certainly on, on the information on our website, on our deadlines pages, 
um, where you go to physically apply, you'll see it echoed several times. In terms of eligibility, um, you know, folks that, that you know, uh, want to get started with the program tend to have, you know, earned a BSN already, um, a Bachelor's of Science in Nursing. We also have folks that are like yourself, coming back after having earned a master's degree already, right? Looking in, potentially adding a new a specialty or another certification. Um, and we certainly offer a postgraduate certificate or just an, another opportunity to, again, learn at this graduate level um, specific to, to the new specialty. Um, you also have, as, as was mentioned just a little, little bit ago uh, in, in those slides immediately preceding, um, were you know, the postgraduate DMP or the doctorate options. So you could go um, certainly into the pathway if you know right ahead, you know, ahead of time or right, right away while you're applying, hey, I wanna earn both my master's and uh, my doctorate degree, you could choose one of the pathways um, listed there to do so. And in terms of admissions requirements, um, again, as I mentioned, this information is, is placed in several areas on our website and in the actual application um, service that we use called Nursing CAS. Um, students who you know, are eligible for our program or, or you know, are looking to seek admission have earned a cumulative undergraduate GPA of a 3.0 on that traditional semester grading scale. Um, typically, you know, I don't find many issues with that. Most folks have completed um, their, their undergraduate um, degrees or programs uh, with the 3.0. If there are issues regarding that, we certainly can chat about, you know, options for how to, um, how to present yourself in another way or potentially take some additional courses to up that uh, GPA. We certainly ask for two prerequisite courses to be complete um, at the undergraduate level. That being an EBP course, um, you did see that you will take an evidence-based practice course with us at the graduate level as well in our program, but you certainly need to have it coming in through um, the pathway for admission. Typically, that is a part of a BSN program. I haven't seen too many programs that don't um, nowadays include it. And then also an undergraduate level statistics course. Um, both of these prerequisites can be outstanding at the time of application. Um, so we certainly can talk about, you know, where you can complete those, if we have options to take them um, with us online, um, and potentially that opportunity to kind of double dip or use some of those credits towards um, the, the degree if you choose to earn one. Um, application is relatively easy, although um, it requires, you know, a lot of follow up. So while it's not a difficult application to, to complete, um, we actually use a tertiary third party that does all of our heavy lifting for us. So nursing CAS, um, and CAS is, is short for centralized application service. So they are our tertiary third party that is in the east, is on the east coast, um, really going through all of our applications, all of the uh, materials that are received, and making sure that applications are processed uh, by our by our by our deadline. It's a dynamic application. So anything that you are submitting, you have the opportunity to go in and kind of see um, as a part of your materials. Um, there are items, which we'll talk about, um, that letters of recommendation, which is at the bottom of the screen there, um, mm -hmm. things that, that again can trickle in a little bit later or that you might wanna get started on earlier. Um, so one of the things that I kind of prep students with ahead of time is those transcripts. Um, if you've had an academic history that has been varied, right? That has been at a couple of different institutions, earned a couple of degrees, maybe you're a diploma nurse, got an ADN, continued on to your BSN, there will be a few institutions that you will need transcripts from. So that said, I always encourage students to get started on that process early. We don't know what is going to happen, you know, with the height of cold and flu season coming. And so just to be, uh, you know, aware of what, you know, what you could, what you could face, uh, meaning, you know, just slower processing times at, at institutions. Um, so you will need copies of all official transcripts from any institution that you attended at the, at the collegiate level, so any college level courses. Um, we ask students to just reach out to those institutions directly and you can provide them with an address to have the transcripts sent to you, or we also use a clearinghouse um, 
a clearinghouse process, which is just institution to institution. It's an online um, database service where you'll put in, you know, where you attended, it'll have you pay, and then you'll you know, have the, the transcripts with receipt, um, in essence, sent um, to the institution and yourself. Outside of that, we certainly ask you to complete a personal statement. Um, we want to know, as, as was mentioned when we got started in the presentation today, why you're interested in the program. So why see you, why informatics, you know, what are you looking to do with continuing your education? Um, and so I typically, when I'm chatting with students, ask them to think about, you know, doing so in a pretty concise way. Um, while we're not bound by space necessarily in our online programs, we certainly still want to make sure that we're, you know, reading through our admissions, you know, materials and, and evaluating our candidates based on fit. You know, does this make sense for you to get into this program? And, and can we talk about, you know, where your goals may align with, you know, the expectations for our program? Outside of that, we lastly also ask you to upload a copy of your nursing license. Although you do not have to live, um, you know, in Colorado to pursue the program with us, and several of our students do not, um, you know, we, we certainly want to make sure that you have the ability to complete that, that practicum um, and have a place to be able to, you know, be precepted. And so again, we will ask you for these materials as, as were discussed um, to determine your eligibility for admission. In terms of a timeline, and I apologize that the blue is a little bit light there, um, but I always like to just kind of give folks a, a general view of, of what they can expect in the months to come. So right now, and as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, our application has been open for a few months now. We generally give about four to five months or so for that cycle to be open, and it's typically for a year in advance. So right now, um, as of September 1, our application for our fall 22 term is open or for our fall 22 cycle um, is, is open. Anywhere between the beginning of this year, early January 2021, all the way through really, you know, November timeframe, we could still be having conversations with students about, you know, admission to the program. So if you're falling in that kind of time frame, it's perfect. Um, I encourage students, you know, really between January and October to be exploring the program with us formally. That means reading information on the website, attending information sessions like this definitely connecting with the faculty to ask questions that you may have about the curricula or, um, you know, again, things like, where am I going to be precepted or how does that work into the program? Um, definitely by kind of the holidays, you know, the, the first um, November holiday, the Thanksgiving timeframe, I encourage students to be thinking about hit and submit on that application if they have not yet. Um, we do have a $65 application fee that goes directly to nursing cast, again, for all of that heavy lifting that they've done. And then there is a $50 supplemental fee. And that happens uh, or, or was received by the college on the back end as we do an audit of all of the, um, the admission applications that come through and get them prepared for our faculty for review. Um, so again, that holiday timeframe, uh, third week or so of November, certainly need to be submitting that application if you're serious about moving forward. Um, again, it will take a few weeks following that for nursing cast to process all of your um, documents and to, again, give you updates of where you are throughout that process. I always encourage if you can, if you can get things submitted before then, before Halloween, ideally, then you're really in good shape. Um, we will, following the close of the deadline, um, and, and the application will close December 15th, and that is for all of our graduate specialties. Our application closes on the same time frame. So if you can imagine, there's just lots of traffic going through to that nursing cast site. And I always say Murphy's Law is what it is. If something wrong is going to happen, it is going to happen at that 11th hour. And unfortunately, it may not always be that we are on the phone or, or available here on ground to be able to you know, pick up those calls. So I just want you know, to, again, encourage you um, to start the application process as soon as you can and to, again, just work your way through the pieces that are being asked. Um, when that application closes, 
We will, as I mentioned, take some time um, in, in my department to review and get applications forward um, to the program for, you know, for review and, and determination on who they'd like to interview. The interviews typically take place virtually um, and they can take place anywhere between really February and March um, of, the, of the admission year, right? So early in the spring, if you are considering admission in the fall. And then between kind of the, the dates following, right? So we, we will do all of our interviews virtually. And Dr. Dr. Wills, I would just wanna, oh, I always wanna say, I start to say your full name and then always, you know, just kind of bite it. And, and so I wanna say that she will do the interviews specifically, um, you know, with potentially other faculty in the program, but be the one really making the decisions on um, who's admitted and, and, you know, again, creating a good expectation for applicants when she's chatting with them. So really talking about, you know, what, what you can expect in the program. It's a great opportunity for you to ask questions as well and, and make sure that you feel like um, you're going to get the most out of the experience with us. In April, we tend to launch the um, decision letters or, or to get those out to students. Oftentimes, um, we can release letters a little bit earlier, depending on, again, um, you know, where, where the decisions are falling with the program. Um, and then finally, kind of in, in that late spring, early summer timeframe, you are working on preparation steps to get yourself started with the program in uh, late August. So that gives you a sense of um, the timeline between now and the end of, in the end of really the cycle for us. Um, if you have additional questions about you know, where you should be or where you're falling in any of these times during, um, you know, during this information, feel free to reach out to us. We're happy to clarify um, as well. One of the other things I like to just mention, and, and Dr. Ayers or Wilson, you're certainly welcome to advance to the next slide if you'd like to. Um, but I always like to just give a couple of tips. As I mentioned, you know, there are certain times of the year that are heavier, I think, you know, just in, in priorities for, for ourselves. So again, if you can create your nursing profile now, and if you're considering applying to the program, do so. Um, that doesn't cost you anything. It's to go out, get your profile set up. Um, if you order transcripts, those transcripts will match, um, you know, your record. So there's some things that you can do kind of early, even if you're not quite ready to, you know, move forward with the entire process. Um, so I just kind of talked about those first two things that are there. Excuse me, but you can also, like I said, have conversations with us. We want you to look at the information on the website. We want to talk to you. We want to know, you know, again, if there's, if there's, you know, questions that you have about, can I work while I'm pursuing this, you know, how, what's the, what's the pace truly like for someone who has a family? Um, we certainly can connect you with active students that can elaborate on their experiences in the program. And then as mentioned, you know, it builds a stronger network um, around the nation. So students who've graduated um, from our program are, are super excited to talk about their experience. And again, you just never know what that might lead to in terms of other professional connections um, as well. So again, we encourage you to talk to us, reach out to us, ask the questions that you have and before, um, you know, the, the end of the year. Lastly, I always encourage students to be thinking about how they'll pay for the program. Um, so if you like that advance one more for me, we do have um, information about tuition on our website, on the pages specifically, but I always like to be super, super clear. Um, we have so many pathways to enter the program, whether you're interested in, you know, returning for a second specialty, Leanne, or getting a, you know, a, a certificate with us. You can take individual classes, um, but students who are Colorado residents um, and then who may also qualify for um, in a, a resident classification will pay $7.25 per credit hour. Students who reside out of state um, for some of the programs, again, this is specific to the DMP portion of the program or to the PhD portion of our degree programs would, again, pay a, an out-of-state rate. Um, what Dr. Gerald Wilson um, mentioned earlier was that, you know, there is a, a, a tuition rate that is similar for our graduate students, students pursuing the either the master's with us or the postgraduate certificate, they will pay the same tuition regardless of where they reside. 
And so that is certainly a point that we wanna highlight. Um, but we also want students to be aware that if you continue your education, and we certainly want you to, um, that tuition rate will be a little bit higher if you reside out of state. And that I think is about all that I have um, on my end. I'm open to take some questions or we can both field questions together if, if there are any that, um, that you may still have. Um, I guess I, I have a question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, a lot of my, like my statistics and um, some of those classes you mentioned as prereqs are old. Old, yeah, yeah, <laughs> from 2001. Yeah. Um, is that okay? Is there a time limit to those? No time limit. So we tend to hear that in undergraduate all the time. Oh my gosh, I took this, you know, chemistry class or oh, I don't want to take it again, please. <laughs> You know, and we don't have the same limitations on prerequisites at the graduate level. So as long as you took it, you earned it at a you know, regionally accredited institution, it mm -hmm. satisfies the credit hours that we're looking for, and it can be as old as you need it to be. Okay. <laughs> Not to date myself, but right, no, <laughs> some no. of them are 20 years old. Yeah. I so, um, and then as far as, because I, I have a master's in nursing, so, yep. and I'm looking at DMP programs, I'm also looking at certificate. Is there, if I... Am I just applying to one like, of What's those? the difference? We certainly can talk to you about the difference. I can do a general overview of the difference. And then Dr. Okay. Guerrero Wilson, yeah. I will get Dr. it. Dr. GW, it works. Yes, <laughs> Dr. GW will absolutely work too. And I will get that pronunciation correct. Um, but she, she can talk to you specifically about, you know, credits or other, you know, um, uh, content that you can expect in the programs. What I would say is the difference between the two, um, the postgraduate certificate is that you are coming back basically for a second master's, right? That you are going, to, we're going to do an overlap of your previous coursework from your FMP program and overlay that with the current master's degree for our informatics program. Anything that is overlapping, so typically there's going to be general core classes that overlap your policy, your theory, Maybe you took an ABP at that point um, or nursing research, and, and maybe you took an informatics course. We're going to be looking for those general four classes that are shared amongst our 12 specialties. If you've taken those and the grades are where they need to be, et cetera, no need to take those again. What you're coming in and looking at truly doing is taking the specialty core classes and along with any practicum that you're going to need to support um, you know, moving you forward and, and feeling comfortable um, conferring the degree. So that's the short of the PGC, our postgraduate certificate. Typically, it's anywhere between 18 and 24 months. It just depends on what credits you need, how fast, that type of thing. We can look at, again, part-time versus full-time enrollment um, as well. In terms of our postgraduate DMP, and I do want to add that I also advise for that particular track um, as well for students that you certainly can reach out to Dr. Jenkins, um, but you make it back to me as well. Um, and, and, you know, we can do an overlay of, of, in essence, why one would pursue that program. But it is truly looking at if, if beyond, you know, that graduate level, you're looking for the doctorate. Um, it, it's taking you to that terminal degree level. You are going to be able to implement change and you are doing a change project. In essence, in, in the DMP, we expect that you kind of have a clinical setting to be able to do the work within. So that's the other element um, that's important to note. The um, PGC, the postgraduate certificate, does have some built-in practicum hours, but you certainly have that at the DMP level. There are a thousand clinical hours that are required to earn your DMP. Now we can take 500 hours typically from your previous master's degree. So we'll take a look at your transcripts, again, do that gap analysis. But in essence, if you are already an APRN, you mentioned to us that you're an FMP, we can likely look at those transcripts and, and take 500 hours and be able to credit them. Now our DMP program has built in 540 hours. So you're gonna already be over that thousand hour requirement with things combined, but we do not, you know, we're not gonna minimize any hours in the program that are already built in, so. That is how that would work. And I will let Dr. GW talk to you a little bit more about, like I said, content or um, maybe, you know, add to anything that perhaps I missed um, in, in the explanation. Well, I think China provided a really good uh, explanation on the general transfer of the, the credits. And um, 
with you coming from already having a master's, the, the credits that would probably overlap that you could already get existing credit for, which is a nice bonus. Um, so you would concentrate on core courses for the informatics program, and then you would, um, which includes a practicum or an internship of 270 hours, which I mentioned. Um, and that's mostly because in informatics, the, um, the projects don't always finish up quickly like patient care. <laughs> you know, so so they have they have a little bit more involvement yeah. or sometimes the project might get tabled because there's something that's more important that has to be implemented. So the student would switch projects. So you have 270 hours, but I will forewarn you. Um, AACN, so the American Colleges of Nurses, they are increasing the internships to 500 hours. We oh. haven't quite figured out how that's going to happen. Um, and NPs have a thousand hours. So there you go. Um, okay. But, yeah, no, tell me about it. And that's actually why um, my certification through is ANCC, so. <laughs> right. Um, so uh, currently the students are uh, working at their their place of employment, you know, like they might be in clinical and then they move over to the informatics slash IT side uh, for a project, or they do a project that is specific to their clinical environment that's related to informatics. Like they might be having a new um, um, implementation of new technology. So they do it for the clinical project. Other students have decided they wanna to go to a clinic. So they might go to one of the community clinics to do it. Or um, since I came on in January, I'm also encouraging students to look at atypical experiences. So we've got one student who's working at AORN, the Association of Perioperative Registered Nurses. She lives in Washington and she's doing a virtual program or practicum in Denver at AORN and she's working on a database for them. Um, we have another student who's virtual who's working over at um, UC Health, um, and she's developing a, um, I believe it's a, a dashboard of types for some data on transplant patients. But um, we're, I'm making connections with some vendor communities and startup um, organizations so that the students can try something different especially yeah. if they're currently in an acute care setting, mm -hmm. uh, so they can see that there's other applications for informatics. So that's, you know, that's something that we can talk about later if you decide you want to come into the program. Um, you mentioned certificates. We do have a certificate in healthcare informatics. Um, you can, it's 24 hours and you can transfer up to 12 hours into the master's program if you change your mind that you'd rather have a, um, uh, a degree versus a certificate. Uh, there are a few core courses and then there's electives that you can take. So it's, it's up to the individual. Now the certificate won't prepare you to work totally independent as an informatics nurse or an informatics specialist, but it complements the um, the role that the individual's in. So if you're in informatics, but you don't have a degree, it's a great way to go. If you're a nurse practitioner or you're in leadership and you want the certificate, it gives you enough informatics background that you can take it and turn around and be more hands-on in the clinical environment related to the technology or the data uh, that you're, you're currently working with. So that would be something that we would explore also. Um, Let's see what else. The, I mentioned the program was really flexible. So most students um, in the program currently work either part-time or full-time and they start out as a part-time student. Some students um, decide to go full-time and they can complete the uh, master's degree in two years. Uh, part-time students either do it in two and a half up to five years. Five years is really pushing it. 
<laughs> and that's because life got in the way mostly, <laughs> you know, so, and I understand that I, when I got my PhD, life was all over the place. <laughs> so I understand that. Um, but we do encourage students to finish their degree sooner um, because it, it only helps you because you don't have that long path of, you know, trying to figure out additional funding or whatever. If it's all up front, it's easier to um, get it together more or less. Um, but those are the pretty much the the key areas. Is there anything specific that you can think of that you might um, want more information before we end our session? Um, no, um, I guess one very just admissions question is um, one of the references has is academic. Um, and again, I have I graduated in well 2008 with my master's, so mm -hmm. it's been quite a while. Um, so, yep. I mean, so we, we actually encourage just new grads to get um, a letter from an academic reference, unless you've kept a tight, you know, bond with someone from that, you know, from that program. I mean, Professional references my... are mm. what okay. you need at this point. Yep. And, and so those are going to be, I think, your most valuable, given where mm -hmm. you where you are in your career right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and we use the references to see how we um, let me put it this way, we combine it with the transcripts to make an evaluation how the student will do because we want you to be successful. Mm -hmm. um, and if you can't get a letter of reference, is it because you didn't try? Um, you, an individual didn't um, perform very well, so they, they can't find somebody who will support them? You know, so those are some of the things that, um, kind of create challenges, but if you really want to be in the program, um, you know, find the best references that you can, you know, in the professional environment. When I got my PhD, um, the school I went to required two academic. <laughs> and boy, it was over 10 years since I had been in school previously. <laughs> so I really had to dig. Yeah, I think my professor would be like Leanne. Who? Yeah. <laughs> I went to University of Florida, and I was I think I said yeah. 2008, and they would um, okay. I guess we could pull up your transcripts. <laughs> yeah, yeah the, the professional references I think are probably what we see the most of, unless mm -hmm. we've got some new you know new grads that are coming out. Um, we've got you know clinical preceptors that often will write letters of recommendation or some supervisors. Um, so again, we say we, we have some physicians, as long as they can talk about your capacity, you know, that you'd be working within mm -hmm. or how they've worked with you in that professional capacity. Mm -hmm. um, we know that the philosophies between medicine and nursing differ. And so just want to make sure because people often think like, oh, I'll just get, you know, I get a reference from a doc and it'll be a strong, like, no, actually, maybe that's not the strongest reference all the time. So we want you to really mm -hmm. think about um, the, you know, the, the capacity, the relationship that you have to the reference. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, don't, don't think you have barriers. We can find a way around all of them. Okay. Not a problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. My, my current supervisor is, uh, Dr. Krista Estes. Oh yeah. So yeah. yeah. Maybe she'll write me. Yeah. I was like, that's a perfect <laughs> reference. <laughs> she does, and I'll go knock on her door. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, that's a perfect reference, and she is certainly, you know, more than she's very familiar with the with the reference process on our end. She's specially director for the FMP program here. Yeah, so, I worked yeah. I worked with her for seven years at Little Clinic, and then okay. when I quit there, she she reached out to me and said, "Would you want to do some contract faculty here?" So. Yeah, that's even oh, very good. You, know, you, you so. could get another reference from somebody else that you've been collaborating with as contract faculty too, mm -hmm. you know, and that's more than acceptable. Okay. Um, yeah. Now, if you have a stellar student who obtained their PhD or DMP, you could use them too. <laughs> I think if anybody's got enough to there, yeah, actually, <laughs> I've been for a couple of years, so yeah. Okay. <laughs> Well, good deal. We, we've yeah. left our contact information um, for you as well. And I'll stick, we can stick some other items really fast. Sorry, as you hear me typing, okay. um, but in the chat box here. And again, encourage you to just keep, um, keep in contact with us or as you have additional questions to, to reach out to us. Um, 
we do, I was going to say, I think this might be our last um, informatics yeah. session. We've got one call. more. Oh, we, we have one more. Yeah, we have one more in November. So if you want to come back and listen to it again, okay. uh, <laughs> well, you have more questions. We'll be more than happy to answer yeah. those. <laughs> yeah, say if you want to jump back on and just talk to us live, that's another opportunity. Yeah, yeah, to do so. okay. yeah just reach out anytime. Um, you know, I've had individuals contact me directly. And, you know, if you contact China, She'll make sure I'll get it. <laughs> it's not a problem. Um, but I've set up calls with people. You know, some people want to communicate by email. Other people want to have a call. I think a call is more beneficial because uh, you're a little bit more fluid in your conversation. And you might think of something that your fingers don't necessarily communicate. <laughs> well, and question answers lead to more questions. That's right. Time, so. Right, right, right. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for your time. Thank you today. very much. No, thank you. This was great. <laughs> so, <laughs> All right. See, one on one. We love it. Okay. okay. <laughs> All right. Well, you guys Bye. have a nice day. Thank you. You too. You too. Take care. Bye-bye.